Hey team, Dr. Jack Gordy, and in this video, I'm gonna jump into the ELISA, which is an assay that we do all the time in the labs upstairs in my research facility, but also over in hospitals for diagnostic. Now, ELISA stands for Enzyme-Linked Immunosorbent Assay. That doesn't actually tell you a huge amount other than it's an assay. And the term immunosorbent might, might make you think it's something to do with the immune system, and it is. It's that we use antibodies as a tool in this research assay. So it's not an antibody fighting disease, it's an antibody that we're going to use as a tool. And it's linked, these, en uh, these antibodies will be linked to an enzyme. Now it's a color metric assay, and what do we use it for? Well, we use it to measure the levels of certain biological molecules in a solution. So we have a solution, we don't know how much of a biological molecule is in that solution, so we need to do an ELISA to measure the amount of that substance in that solution. What's an example? Well, let's say we're doing a clinical test and we want to know, do you have an infection? We don't know what the infection is, we just want to know, do you have an infection? Well, a technique we might do is measure the inflammatory cytokines. Remember, cytokines are a protein signaling molecule released by your immune system in response to an infection. So if we look for an inflammatory cytokine, the one I introduced before was IL-1, interleukin-1. Let's say we want to know, do you have an infection? We might take your blood, measure the IL-1 levels, and the IL-1 levels might tell us whether or not you have an infection or whether or not you are are at least having an inflammatory response to that infection. Now, IL-1 is a protein, so how are we going to measure just IL-1? Remember, there's loads of protein floating around your blood. How are we going to single out the human interleukin-1 molecule in order to quantify it? And this is where the ELISA comes in, so let's jump into it. So the ELISA utilizes antibodies, right? So antibodies are produced by an immune system and they specifically bind to an antigen and that antigen is ideally pathogenic. But here's the really interesting thing is you will produce antibodies to an antigen um, even if that antigen isn't associated with a pathogen. And we learned this and learned to manipulate it. So here we've got a little goat here Let's say we purify human interleukin-1, right? So we purify that cytokine IL-1 and it's human. Let's say we essentially vaccinate this goat with human IL-1. So we inject IL-1 into this goat. Because the human IL-1 is different to the goat IL-1, it appears to be a foreign protein, an other protein. It's not a self protein from the perspective of a goat. The human IL-1 that's now circulating around the goat appears to be a foreign protein. What's going to happen is that goat is going to produce antibodies for that human IL-1 that will bind to it rather specifically and because it thinks it's a pathogen, right? What we can then do is isolate the antibodies from that goat to use in research. Now, sometimes we use multiple animals, um, rabbits and mice and rats are common and also donkeys, right? So imagine if we took human IL-1, we injected into a goat and we got um, into we got an antibody that would bind to human IL-1 from the goat, and then we inject it into a donkey, and we get an antibody that will bind to human IL-1 in that donkey. Now we have what we need to perform an ELISA. So let's do a rundown on how this works. Now, ELISAs are done in 96 well plates, um, which are those plastic plates that are covered in, in wells, and they're flat bottom 96 well plates. Now, they're made out of a special plastic. They're not regular um, 96 well plates. They're made out of a special plastic that adheres proteins, right? It, it, it's all proteins kind of stick to this plastic. So let's have a look at this well. Now, we're going to imagine we're just going to look at two wells, and we're looking at those wells side on, right? So we're looking at those wells side on. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to add the goat antibody to uh, these wells, and these antibodies will be purified, and they'll just be in a salt solution called PDS, right? Now, because antibodies are proteins, these proteins, I'm going to draw them extra big, these antibodies are going to stick to the bottom of the plate. 
and this is called coating. So we have now coated the plate with the goat antibody, and this antibody binds to human IL-1. Now we've got a little bit of a problem there. The whole plate isn't fully coated in protein, so now there's still sticky plastic around. We don't want that sticky plastic around, so what we're going to do is we're going to put in a protein, uh, just a, a, a run-of-the-mill protein that's nothing to do with anything. It's actually called albumin, bovine serum albumin. But we just put in a protein that we don't care about, and that's going to fill in the gaps on the sticky plastic, hiding the plastic. So now the plastic is not sticky anymore, and this is called blocking. So we've now blocked the ELISA plate with a non-specific protein that we call albumin. And we typically get that from a cow, so it's bovine albumin. But right, so now the plates are not sticky anymore, and the only thing sort of sticking out is that antibody for IL-1. Now we're going to put in our plasma. We're going to put in our human plasma. And we're going to imagine two patients, right? So we... We put in some liquid into these wells, and we're going to imagine two patients. One of the patients has human interleukin 1 beta because they have an infection. Another of the patient does not. So in this one, we've got interleukin 1 beta. Now, interleukin 1 beta is immediately going to start to bind to these antibodies, right? So now we've got human interleukin 1 beta. Um, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to say, this guy, this patient has maybe rolled his ankle or maybe, you know, something. Just has a small amount of IL-1 beta. Probably not clinically relevant. This patient over here has lots of IL-1 beta because they have an infection. What's going to happen is the IL-1 is going to be bound by the antibodies. And the saturation of those antibodies, how many of the antibodies in the plate are fully bound to IL-1, is dependent on the concentration of IL-1. So we've got high concentration over here and low concentration over here. And so all the antibodies are bound to IL-1 over here. And all only a few of the antibodies have bound IL-1 over there, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to put in our donkey antibody. Now... Um, what we will do is to the donkey antibody that also binds to IL-1, we're going to attach an enzyme. This enzyme is called horse radish peroxidase or HRP, and it's going to be attached to the antibody. Now, this is sometimes done in multiple stages using this interaction called biotin avidin interaction. But just to simplify things, we're going to imagine the horse radish peroxidase is directly attached to the donkey antibody. So in comes the donkey antibody in here. Here's the donkey antibody. Now we're going to get lots of donkey antibody on this one. And attached to those is an enzyme. Uh, let's draw that in red. Okay, attached to those is a little enzyme. I like to draw enzymes like Pac-Man. So these enzymes will facilitate a reaction here. Now, what reaction are those enzymes going to facilitate? What we then do is we wash the plate, so all the unbound antibodies are going to wash out. We wash actually at each step, so we're going to wash out everything so it's all nice and clean. And now we're going to put in a substrate. Now, this substrate is colorless. Loads of this colorless substrate. Now, this substrate will react and um, we often the substrate there's multiple ones but let's call it this is called tmb as an example um, this will be an, a reaction will occur facilitated by those enzymes that will convert it into a colored substrate hang on let me change this for the appropriate color it will convert it into yellow ultimately oh can you see that yeah you can see that nice Right, so now we've got um, a colorless substrate being converted into a color substrate. Now, I've mentioned this previously. A lot of assays are about amplification, right? You get a weak signal and we need to amplify it. This enzyme is amplifying the signal. For every one interleukin-1 molecule, we have an enzyme, HRP. Actually, I'll write that down for you guys. So this is HRP. P, horse radish peroxidase. It's an enzyme that we got from horse radish. Um, 
this enzyme will be able to convert multiple loads of TMB colorless molecules into a colored product, a yellow product, right? So the uh, the single IL-1 molecule signal is now being amplified massively into a lot of colored yellow TMB molecules. Now, what we will see, let's have a top down, uh, let's have an Let's have a view of this. Boom, boom, boom. So in this one, I'm just going to color it. So what we will end up with is we'll end up with a well with a huge amount of yellow product being produced. And over here, we've got a very weak amount of yellow. So loads of sub loads of TMB uh, substrate was converted into a yellow product because there was lots of HRP enzymes in there because those antibodies that can specifically recognize um, I, human IL-1 bound to that IL-1 that was found in the plasma there. Now you can guess what we're going to do here. We're going to put this into a plate reader. The plate reader has a laser and a detector. draw it like a little eyeball because it basically is a little eyeball so the plate reader has got a laser and detector it's only got you know it, it only has one laser and one detector but it moves the plate around to scan each one and what they're going to do is shoot a blue light through now remember the reason why the wells are yellow is because it absorbs all the wavelengths of light except for yellow right so yellow light will shoot straight through these wells but blue light will be absorbed by the well which is why it appears yellow right the blue light's being stripped out of um, our, our visual spectrum so all we're seeing is what's left over so in this well the blue is pretty much going to go straight through and be detected by the receptor but in this one, the blue light is going to be absorbed by the yellow pigment. And so we won't see the blue light come out the other side. So we've got high absorbance over there and low absorbance over there. And the absorbance correlates with the amount of IL-1. Now, what we can actually do is un under a whole row of the, um, under a whole row of the ELISA blade, let me just scan this across a little bit. We can put in known amounts of IL-1 and these will become our standards. And what we typically do is do that in a serial dilution. So over here, we might have a known amount, like a thousand picograms per mil. This is picograms per mil. We've got a thousand picograms. Then we've got 500. Then we've got 250. Da, 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 and we've got zero, right? Now, these will have a particular absorbance. So this is absorbance. This is how much light was, how much blue light was absorbed. So at 250 picograms of IL-1, remember, these are wells that we intentionally put, these are separate wells that we intentionally put specific amounts of IL-1 in, so we can then use them as a standard or a comparison, right? So um, uh, 250 might have this absorbance, 500 might have this absorbance, and 1000 might have this absorbance. So we end up with a standard curve. Now, often this is curved. It is actually pretty linear because we use the linear ranges of the spectrum, but often it's a little bit curved. So we put a curve on there. So now let's have a look. Let's go to, um, the, let's call this one well one and this one well two. So well one has, that's a terrible two, I'm sorry. Well uh, one has very low absorbance. So we might come along here and go, do, 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 do. and then we go down this is called interpolating and then we might say okay it's got a hundred picograms per mil based on that now well two so this is well one well two might have a lot of absorbance right up here so it has a huge amount of absorbance and what we can do is go across and then down this is called interpolating. You can do it with a ruler, but it's actually done formulaically um, where they solve the equation to figure out what it is. And so that might be 800. So now that we can see, now we can maybe draw this on a bar graph. We get patient one down here. Patient two up here. This is 800. One. So we can see patient two has way more IL-1 in their plasma than patient one. So this is roughly how an ELISA works. Now there are actually multiple kinds of ELISA and this one is called a sandwich ELISA. And the reason why it's called a sandwich ELISA is you can kind of see it. We've got an antibody here, then we've got interleukin-1 beta, 
then we've got another antibody. It's sandwiched between it, right? So we've got an antibody, another antibody up here, and then in between them, ooh, how about that for clever? In between them, we've got um, we've got the interleukin one beta, right? So it's a sandwich between the two antibodies. This allows us to ensure specificity. I mentioned this before. The antibodies are reasonably specific for their antigen, but they sometimes bind to different antigens. So if we have two antigens that recognize the one molecule, we're double, triply sure that that um, sorry, two antibodies that recognize the one antigen, we can be doubly sure that that antigen is the IL-1 that we wanted to investigate, and it's not some non-specific binding um, to a different antigen. So that's the ELISA. I'll take a scan of this, and I might even put it in the link below so you can have a look at the image itself. Awesome. Thanks, team.